from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you're using one of the red church Bibles, that can be found on page 142. So if you have a Bible, please open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. When I'm finished reading, I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord. And you can respond by saying, thanks be to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 through 21. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance, but not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we've known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He's a new creature, new creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Parents, at this time, if you'd like to, you may dismiss your kids to junior worship. And as the kids are making their way out, I want to introduce our speaker for today, Jim Panaggio. We've known the Panaggios for a long time. They've uh, been partnering with us in ministry in Latin America. We've been partnering with them. They were missionaries in Peru for about 15 years. And some of you might remember we took six or seven trips down there. And uh, actually one time their pastor came here and spoke, and Jim and Kay were the connection that made all that happen. We had wonderful years of ministry with them. Since then, Jim and Kay have transitioned. Uh, Jim went on, and he, he won't tell you this, but he has a PhD in theology. So he's, a, he's Dr. Panaggio, but we can just call him Jim. Uh, and he is using his skill in Spanish and his understanding of Latin America and his theological training to uh, raise up the next generation of uh, theologically trained uh, teachers in Latin America. So he's traveling all over Latin America. We've heard about that in Sunday school. And he himself is a great teacher, so he's going to be opening up God's word for us today. So Jim, come and teach us, brother. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. It's a It's a privilege to be here and be able to open God's word and share in this time together. Before we do that, would you join me for a word of prayer? Father, thank you for this great privilege to be able to have in our very hands the word of God, to be able to open it freely, to read it, and to preach it. It's an incredible gift. I realize many people don't enjoy this gift the way we do, but thank you for giving us this freedom. And now we ask, please, oh God, may your spirit come and work to transform our lives. I I beg you to overcome my weakness, my inadequacy, my sin. In spite of all that I am, I pray that it would be you speaking on this day for your glory. Fill me with your spirit, oh God. And open every heart and mind that we might receive what you want to say. And when we leave this place, oh God, may we be different. May we know that we have had an encounter with you through your word and that you have changed us. Please open every heart and mind and speak as only you can speak. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. 
Well, I congratulate you on your missions conference. Um, how many of you, this is the first missions conference that you've ever attended? How many of you don't want to raise your hand in front of other people? Thank you. One honest soul, the rest are liars, all of you. No, uh, missions conferences are great times to inspire the people of God uh, regarding God's global purpose. Uh, mission conferences have played a really important part in my life. When my wife and I were still in seminary and uh, trying to figure out what God was going to do uh, through us or in us for our future, we went to a missions conference and there were inspired. And the result was we ended up um, going on a short-term missions trip to the country of Chile. And then it was through a missions conference. I was a pastor in western New York, had been there several years pastoring, loved what I did. Um, but I went to a missions conference, and through that missions conference, I was challenged to reconsider whether God really wanted me to be a pastor or whether He was calling my, my wife and I and our family to be missionaries. And the, the result was we ended up being missionaries. And so missions conferences have a powerful potential to impact our lives and to move us towards considering a change of direction. So the question that generally we ask in every missions conference, even though we might not say it face to face, it might not be something we verbalize, the question that every missions conference really is focusing on is this question. Are you, as a Christian, open to the possibility that God wants you to be a missionary. I mean, every missions conference has as its goal, at least one of its goals, the asking of that question. Now, I could come here today, this morning, and the other missionaries um, could do the same thing, and we could directly ask that question. I could say to you, are you open to a change of focus if God wanted to call you to leave this place and to go and be a missionary in another place, and I could ask that question directly to you, probably wouldn't have as much impact. You could say, yeah, it's an interesting question. Thanks for asking it. Uh, what's for lunch? Or I could come and I could present to you an illustration. I could tell you a story. I could set before you a real-life missionary and say, let me give you an illustration from life what that looks like. Um, in my own life, as I mentioned, missions conferences, but also stories, mission biographies, and uh, mission movie. In fact, it was a mission movie that really started my wife and I towards the direction of being missionaries. So um, I think more effective than just asking the question is seeing an illustration of a missionary and the impact that the gospel had in that person's life. And so today, I want to bring before you an illustration, a real-life missionary, not my life. Um, that would be kind of boring. But I want to bring before you the life of a former blue-collar artisan, a small business owner, that God got a hold of his life in a radical way, and he became a missionary that really was used to impact the whole world. I'm referring to Paul of Tarsus, the former tent maker that God grabbed a hold of his heart, revolutionized his, his life, and he became a missionary. And all of us read the results, the fruit of his missionary experience. I invite you to turn, as John just read, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the story of Paul's defense of his missionary movement. What happened was Paul was a missionary traveling all over um, Turkey and surrounding areas, and people began to question the legitimacy of his ministry, the legitimacy of the authority that he had as an apostle and as a minister of the gospel. And so Paul had to defend, really, his missionary calling. He had to defend his missionary movement. And part of his defense is right here in this text that we had read for us this morning. And what I'd like to do this morning is look at Paul's defense of his missionary endeavor and focus on, there's many things, but just three aspects of Paul's missionary ministry that I think 
can be helpful and challenging to us. Just three aspects. I think there's an outline in your bulletin, if that would be helpful to you. The first aspect of Paul's missionary ministry that I like to talk about is the motivation for Paul's ministry. What was it that moved Paul to give his life to missions? What was it that set a fire in him that um, caused him to be called crazy by some and uh, to cause people to question uh, Paul's life? Look at verse 11. The first, there's two motivations that I want to center on. Now, Paul, I'm sure, was motivated by many things, but two things that he brings to light in this passage. The first thing, in verse 11, Paul says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Now, it's not politically correct in the evangelical church today to mention that we as Christians can be motivated by fear right? We don't like to talk about that. We say that's inappropriate. We shouldn't be motivated by fear. We should be motivated by love. But Paul is saying very explicitly, very clearly, that it was fear that motivated him to persuade others. He was was driven to convince others of the reality of Christ because there was fear, specifically fear of the Lord. Now, to understand The object of Paul's fear, we have to go back a little bit to verses 9 and 10. So um, flip up a little bit to verses 9 and 10. Paul says, so whether we are at home or away, he's not talking about Lima or outside of Lima. He's talking about whether I'm dead or alive, whether I'm in my body or no longer have my body because that's the whole context that he's been talking about. But simply, if I was dead or alive, he says, this is my ambition. This is my goal in life. We make it our aim to please Him. The primary focus, the primary object of my life, whether dead or alive, he says, is to please God. The question is why. Verse 10, 4, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Why was Paul so committed to pleasing Christ? What was it that drove Paul to say that my primary ambition in life is to please the Lord? What was it, according to the passage? Look in your Bibles and see the answer. What, what, what was it that Paul knew that he would, he would confront one day? He knew that he was accountable to God, that someday all of us, every living creature, would one day stand before the judge, the righteous judge, who must judge according to righteous standards. We can't bribe him, we can't manipulate him, we can't cajole him. The righteous judge one day will stand in judgment over every living being. And Paul said, that's why I seek to please God. That's why my greatest ambition in life is to make my life pleasing to Him because someday He's going to evaluate my life. And what is the criteria of evaluation? My works. That's what it says. Now, a lot of people like to soften it. They like to change it. They're not comfortable with that. and So they say, He's just talking about rewards. But if you look at the context, if you read the passage as it's given, the most obvious and simple way to understand it, Paul is saying this, I have given my life to persuade others of Christ because I am afraid. And what is it that brings fear into my life? It is the recognition that I will one day stand before the judge and all humanity will stand before the judge and we will give an account for our lives. Now, I'm not saying that we're saved by works. Please understand, that's not what Paul is saying there. Paul is not talking about whether a person is saved by works. A person is not saved by works. The whole New Testament is incredibly clear that it's impossible to be saved by works. However, how can I know that your faith is a real faith? There's only one way. What does your faith produce? Works are the confirmation that the faith you profess is a real faith. So the only way to know, faith is invisible. 
unless we make it visible through a life consistent with the faith. And Paul says, all of us are accountable. All of us, one day, will stand before the judge and he will evaluate our works to see if the works are a result of a genuine faith. And that is a fearful thing. And as a consequence, Paul says, I give myself completely to trying to convince men and women to follow Christ. For two reasons, really. One, because I know that I have been called to this work. And so if I'm not faithful in this work of persuading men and women to faith in Christ, then I will have to give an account for that. On the other side, I recognize that all humanity lives in a very dangerous, a very treacherous situation because all humanity will one day stand before the judge and they will give an account. And I don't want people like lemmings just going off the cliff into an eternal separation from God. And so I am persuaded by this fear of recognizing that all of us will stand before Him to persuade men and women, please don't continue in that, in that route, in that way. You must give yourself to Christ. And so the first motivation that Paul had that drove him to missionary life was the fear of the Lord. There's a second motivation that Paul talks about. Oh, by the way, Paul, you notice, Paul says it's because of the fear of the Lord that we persuade men and women. His ministry was a ministry of persuasion, not just of passive presentation. Sometimes we think that the giving of the gospel, well, there's all these alternatives. A really good alternative would be Christ. No. Paul says there's only one way, and my responsibility is to convince people to take that way, not to lay before them alternatives and say, you know, it's a really good option here, a really good option there, go where you want. Paul's ministry was a ministry of persuasion, of convincing people that Christ is the only way. Small parentheses. How passive have we become in the evangelical church in in terms of the gospel? We're afraid to impose. We're afraid to persuade. And sometimes the result is a soft gospel that doesn't move anyone. Now, I'm not saying manipulate because it's interesting. Paul's persuasion was governed also by his fear of the Lord. That is, Paul wasn't going to use manipulative techniques. He wasn't going to be deceptive. Why? Because he also knew that he was going to present himself before the judge. And the judge could see all of his motives. In fact, in verse 11, what does Paul say about about that? He says in verse 11, somewhere... He says, what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. Paul uses the same word in verse 10 that we're all going to appear before the judge. It's the word reveal, be revealed, revelation. Paul says we're going to be revealed before the judge. And then he says, what I am is revealed before God. And I hope that it's revealed before your consciences. He uses the same word three times. What he's, what he's talking about is a transparency. Uh, we are all transparent before the judge. He can see right through us. We are naked in his presence. And Paul says, God knows what I am exactly. He knows when I'm manipulating, when I'm lying, when I'm... He knows me. He can see right through me. And he says, I hope that you can do the same thing, that you can see me in the same way. I want transparency and openness. Nothing veiled, nothing hidden, nothing deceptive. Just, I need to convince you that Christ is the only way. So he persuaded, but his persuasion was with integrity, with transparency. Second motivation that Paul had in verses 12 to 15 He says, we're not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. In other words, Paul's ministry was not about self-commendation. He's not trying to congratulate himself. He's not trying to lift himself up. 
There were a whole lot of others that were doing that. You just read Philippians chapter 1, for example, and other places where there are all kinds of missionaries, people going out, and their primary goal was self-commendation. Paul says, that's not our motivation. Ours is different. Verse 13, 4, if we're beside ourselves, that's, if, if we're nuts, it's for God. Some people thought Paul was crazy. If we're in our right mind, it's for you. Why, Paul? Because he says in verse 14, the love of Christ controls us. Because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him for whose, who for their sake died and was raised. What was it that drove Paul that gripped him so profoundly that he was a prisoner to its power? What was it? The love of Christ. Not just fear of the Lord. That was a real motivation. But Paul says, there was something even beyond that that so gripped my heart, that so gripped my life. I was totally enchanted, captivated. It was the love of Christ. The love of Christ so controlled and so moved the life of Paul, that his entire being, his entire ministry, his entire focus was transformed. It was changed. It was the love of Christ. Now, it's not Paul's love for Christ. Rather, it's Christ's love for Paul that transformed him. And Paul goes on to describe what that love is like. And his love for Paul was focused on one thing and one thing only, the cross. The essence of the love of Christ was displayed in that one event that transformed history, the death of Christ, that self-sacrificing, giving over of Himself. That was the thing that defined the love of Christ for Paul. Paul says, um, we judge this, that one died for all. In other words, the death of Christ was universal in its scope. He died for all humanity. And there's more. Not just that it was a universally um, relevant death. He says, if it's true that one died for all, there's another truth that flows right out of that. What does he say? He says, then all have died. Now, logically, I think about that. Wait, wait, he died for all. How does that mean that all died? Do you get what Paul's saying here? When Christ died, he didn't die alone. You died too. The death of Christ was not, not only a representative death, but it was a death that included all of us. In that moment when Christ was hung on the cross and gave his life, Paul says... Not only did he die for all, but all died with him. There is a sense in which your death was realized in 33 AD, 33 AD, when Christ died. We died with him. I think what Paul has in mind is what he said in Romans chapter 6 that we died together with Christ. We were buried together with Christ through our baptism into death. When Christ broke into your life, that was only the affirmation of a death that took place years before. When He died, you died. And I died. Paul says in Romans 6.6 6, that we, our old man, was crucified together with Christ. He's not talking about something inside of me. It's not that something inside my being died in the moment when Christ died. What he's saying is, all that I was prior to knowing Christ, all that my life encompassed prior to knowing Christ was put to death when Christ died. I am now a new person. See, Paul, when he thinks about you... When he thinks about me, when he thinks about sanctification, this process of being made holy, he always thinks in two big spheres. Imagine one big bubble right here. And that bubble is called in Adam. Everybody who's born is born 
belonging to this sphere of in Adam. And everything that is true of Adam is true of the person who's born in that sphere. But Paul says something happened. When Christ died and you receive Him by faith, you leave this first bubble and you are transferred into a new bubble that's called in Christ. Everything that you were in Adam died. That's your old man. Your old man is all that you were prior to coming to Christ. It's dead. It doesn't exist anymore. You've been transferred into a whole new reality. You are now in Christ. And what is true of Christ is true of you. He died. You died. He was buried. You were buried. He was raised. You were raised. That's our new reality. And Paul says, the love of Christ totally captivated me. Because I understood that when Christ died, I died too. All that I was doesn't exist anymore. He transformed it. But but then he goes on. And he says, in verse 14, I'm sorry, 15, he says, and he died for all. Here's the purpose. So that those who live... Wait a minute, Paul. Are we dead or alive? Paul says all died. But he jumps all of a sudden and talks about those who live. But how could we live if we've died? Well, Paul is sort of um, taking something for granted. He doesn't mention here, but I'm going to mention. To fill the gap, Paul is assuming not only our death with Christ, but also our resurrection with Him. Those who died with Christ buried with Christ, have also been raised together with Christ. And so Paul goes on to say, those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. We all died. Some were raised together with Christ to new life. And there was a purpose in that. Why was it that he raised us to new life in Christ? so that you would have a whole new orientation on your life, so that no longer would you live to yourself. Rather, you would live for Him who gave His life for you and was raised for you. In other words, all self-worship, put to death. All selfishness, put to death. The death of Christ had this purpose, to reorient the focus of your life so that you would not be the center anymore. Imagine that. Imagine you and I living our daily life without us being the center of our lives. But Paul says that's exactly the purpose of the cross. It was to rip out what was at the center of your life and my life and to put Christ in the center and to say from now on I will not live for myself, for my desires, for my priorities, for my values, for what's important to me. From now on, what is at the center of my life is the cross. Our lives are to be cruciform in their shape. Everything about us is to be determined by that and no longer by this. Paul said that's why Christ died. And that love for Christ, or better, the love that Christ displayed for me, giving himself for me, dying for me, to reorient my life, that's what drives me. That's what controls me. That's what captivates me. Because only such a love could do such a radical transforming work in me. It saved you from idolatry to yourself. So that when you stand before that judge, he sees that what's at the center of your existence is no longer you, but him. That drove Paul to give himself to the missionary task. The life-transforming power of the love of Christ, uniquely displayed in the self-sacrificing death of Jesus, completely controlled the life and ministry of Paul, motivating him to share this good news, this transforming love with everyone everywhere. It was the motor that drove his missionary career. That's the motivation, number one. Second point I want to share with you, the second aspect of Paul's ministry is the perspective of Paul's ministry. Paul's encounter with the love of Christ that he displayed in the cross was so transforming 
that it completely reshaped everything about him. And of course, that includes his perspective on ministry. His mission was totally shaped by the cross. Three examples. Three examples of how Paul's life and ministry were shaped by the cross. First, the cross radically changed the lens through which Paul saw people and, in fact, interpreted all of life. The, the very glasses that Paul wore were changed. Look at what he says. He says in verse 16, From now on, you understand the importance of the phrase from now on? From now on marks, a, it puts a stake in the ground. And it says, from this point forward, from that stake, all the way the rest of my life, everything is different. From now on, that means that there's been a change. What I was before, no longer am I. From now on, from this point, from the time that I died with Christ and was raised with Christ, everything is different. What is it that is different, according to Paul? Paul says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. What on earth is Paul saying? Paul's saying from this moment when the stake was put in the ground, when I was made new in Christ, from that point for the rest of my life, I could no longer look at people the same way. I could no longer look at life the same way. He says, before we viewed people according to the flesh. But now we view people a different way. The contrast Paul always makes when he says, according to the flesh, what's the other side? According to the Spirit. Paul's saying simply this. From now on, I cannot view anyone from an earthly perspective. I cannot view life or relationships or anything from a this-worldly perspective. My whole focus is no longer what's here. My whole focus from now on is a brand new perspective. It's a heavenly perspective. It's an otherworldly perspective. He said, I used to know Christ from a worldly perspective. I used to have opinions about what he was and what he did and why he did it. No more. From now on, I can't view you, I can't view life, and I can't view Christ from an earthly perspective. Everything has changed. My glasses are brand new. I see life differently. The cross changes the way you interpret life. The cross changes your opinion of the way things are. You cannot think the same thing about people. You cannot think the same thing about trials, about good things and bad things. You can't view life from the same lens if you're a Christian. Because the cross radically shapes the way you see, the way you interpret life, the way you view relationships. Everything is colored by the cross. Paul says, from now on, I see everything differently. Everything is cruciform. Everything is shaped, influenced, impacted, changed by the cross. Even Christ. Second, Paul says in verse 17 that not only is everything, my lens changed, but Paul says my citizenship is changed as well. Verse 17, therefore, the word therefore, it's a really important word. Paul's showing there's a link between what he just said and what he's going to say. Really, it's not the word therefore, it's the word so that. It's a, it's a, it's a result. He's saying the result of the cross in my life is this, if anyone is in Christ, now I know that the versions that we have say if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, but that's not what it says literally. Literally what it says, if anyone is in Christ, new creation, there's no verb. I mean, Paul just says, if anyone's in, in Christ, in Christ, remember the two spheres, in Adam, in Christ, if you've been transferred from what you were outside of Christ in Adam to a new way of seeing life, you're in Christ. He says, if you're in Christ, there is a new creation and you're part of it. 
We tend to think only about us as individuals. He's saying that I'm a new creature, creature, new creation. It's true. But Paul's idea is so much more global than that, so much more cosmic than that. He's going beyond saying that I'm a new person. He's saying everything is new. From beginning to end, the Bible says that God is at work making all things new, not just me. He's making the entire creation new, the new heavens and the new earth. And Paul is saying that in Christ, eternity has invaded time. The future has invaded the past. Through Christ, the new creation for which we wait has been inaugurated. Now, I know you're looking and you're saying, well, still looks like Lyme, Ohio to me. And it is. But there's another reality. By faith, the new creation has been inaugurated in Christ, and you and I, who are in Christ, are part of that new creation. We are part of all the newness that God is bringing into this world. So then, brothers and sisters, please listen to this. You can no longer live your life as though you are only a member of this present age. You belong to a whole new reality. You belong to a whole new world. You belong to what is future. That's your identity. That's your citizenship. That's from where you gain all of your perspective on life. You cannot merely look at life from your experience because you're a part of a new creation. You have a new constitution with a new government, with new laws, with new values and new priorities. Everything about you has to come from the new reality, which is the new creation. That's the starting point for how you view all of life. Let me just give you a really quick example, okay? Generally speaking, we view people based on their status, their money, education, experience, those kind of things. So a person who we consider important is a person who's got a lot of education, lots of money, lots of influence. That's the way they viewed people in the Roman world, the Greco-Roman world when the first century was uh, in, during the first century. What happens when the gospel comes? What happens when the gospel comes? Paul says in Galatians 3.28, there's no longer male or female. There's no longer Jew or Gentile. There's no longer rich or poor. The entire structure by which we interpret life changes because we belong to a new creation. I can no longer look at another person and say, I'm better than you because I have more degrees. I'm better you than you because I have more money. I'm more important than you are because of my position in society. Paul says, in Christ, all of us are on the same plane. All of us are equal. We are part of a new creation. Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old, all that belonged to the old epic is gone. There's been a turning point in history. We belong to a whole new way, a whole new reality. That is the defining factor in my life. I'm a part of the new creation. And from there I will live, from there I will think, and from there I will treat and react to people around me. And you say, well, that's not my experience. Don't live by your experience. Live by what's true, by what's biblical, by what God said is your reality. The time will come when He will bring the fullness of the eternity into time. Right now we only get a small taste of the future. But enjoy that small taste and recognize that that's your citizenship. And that citizenship is what governed Paul's ministry. Finally, the third example is how, how the cross has radically changed um, our missionary identity. Paul says we are ambassadors of Christ. Verses 18 to 20, all this is from God. That is, all this that I've been telling you about, the change in perspective, the change in citizenship, the, the work of the cross, all of this is from God. It's God's doing. It's what God has been doing in history. Who, God, through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, says Paul, in God, Christ was reconciling the world to Himself, 
not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. God is on a peacemaking mission. God has brokered terms of peace for sinful humanity. All of, all of humanity, all of the world committed treason in the kingdom of God. We looked at our rightful king and we rebelled against him. We separated him. We seceded from the union. All of us were going a different way. And God said, even though they have rebelled against me, even though they have spit in my face, I am going to set things right. And I am going to broker terms of peace. And he did it through Christ. He sent Christ and he says, not counting our sins against us. Can you imagine that? God took, made the decision to not count against our eternal debt, our sins, but rather to take His Son, Christ, and put on Him the weight of all of our sins, thereby making peace. You were at enmity with God. You were His enemy. You were a rebel in His sight. And God said, I want peace with you. And so He brought terms of peace by sending His Son to proclaim peace. Freedom from that debt. And how is He going to make this peace known to humanity? How is He going to spread this, this new treaty of peace that God is inaugurating with humanity? How will, how will He make it known? Through us. We are instruments of peace. We are peacemakers. We are spokesmen for God. God makes His appeal to the rest of humanity through us. He doesn't have another plan. He said, I'm going to take formerly rebellious, separated traitors, and I am going to rescue them and make peace with them, and through them I will spread peace to all humanity. That's why we're ambassadors for Christ. Interesting, in this whole passage, ambassadors for Christ is the implication, it's the consequence of all the rest of his arguments. He gets all the way down to the end. He says, therefore, you're ambassadors for Christ. You're the plan. You're spokesman for God. He sends you out to take the message of peace to the world, proclaiming very simply, God is saying, I've made a treaty, accept my treaty. We are ambassadors for Christ. There's no other plan. We are his spokesmen bringing the message of peace. Paul's missionary identity was totally changed. He became an agent of the kingdom of God, offering to the rebellious world the peace tree that God had made with humanity. As ambassadors of peace, we come from another reality. We come from the new creation. We don't try to impose our culture. We don't try to impose evangelical culture. We don't try to impose our denomination. We come from the new creation perspective, living in the mud and the filth and the garbage of this present evil age. And we say there is another world, and that's waiting for us, and you can be part of it. Christ has come and he's offered peace to all of us. I beseech you to accept the other reality. As ambassadors, we don't get ourselves involved in the affairs of this world. We don't simply accommodate ourselves to the culture and to the ways. We come from another culture. We come from the culture of the new creation. And that's the culture that we bring to this culture. We bring the laws of heaven... We bring the priorities and values of heaven and we try to impose them on a dying, rebellious, separated world because we're ambassadors and ambassadors represent not the place they live but the place from which they come. 
and we come from the new creation, and that is the culture we try to bring to this world. We are ambassadors for Christ. Finally, the third aspect, what was Paul's message? Verses 20 and 21. It says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Our message, brothers and sisters, is a passionate appeal. It is an urgent request. God has brought peace. Accept it. And that's what we say. We come, Paul says, we come and we say, be reconciled to God. God has made peace. He wants to be reconciled to you. Please. I beg you, accept his reconciliation. Accept his treaty of peace. With an urgency, we come to a dying world, a world separated, a world is going to face that judgment, and we say, please, please, I urge you. God has done everything possible. The only thing that's lacking is for you to sign the peace treaty, for you to accept it and say, yes. That's the message. We are spokesmen, and our message is very simply, peace has been offered. Accept the peace. Paul says in verse 21 something that is absolutely amazing. He says, this is, this is really what happened. God made His Son Jesus, who knew no sin, absolutely sinless, flawless, to become sin so that we who were sinners completely filthy, totally depraved, could no longer have that sin, but rather become the righteousness of God. That's the great exchange, right? There's two bank accounts. There's a spiritual bank account that says Jesus Christ. In the credit column is all the righteousness of heaven. I mean, this is just brimming full with righteousness, his account. In his debit column, there's not a thing there. Totally empty. And then there's John Hayward's spiritual account. On the credit side, there is absolutely nothing. It is empty. And on the debit side, it is just brim, brimming full of sin. And God says to John, I'm going to race the name Christ, and I'm going to race the name John Hayward, and I'm going to switch the accounts. The account of Christ becomes your account, so that all of those credits, all of his righteousness now becomes John's righteousness. And all of that sin, that just brimming full of sin, becomes Christ's sin. And that great exchange of accounts results in him being declared not guilty before God and Christ being declared guilty before God so that all the punishment and all the wrath deserving that John deserves is poured out completely on Christ to the last drop and all of the mercy and the grace and the love that God had for his son is poured out on John. That's the great exchange and that's our message. Christ did not become a sinner. That's impossible. But he became sin. That is, he became guilty. And we do not become righteous in the sense that our moral standing or our moral practice all of a sudden is flawless. No way. But we become the righteousness of God, that gracious gift by which he declares us not guilty. That's the great exchange, and that's our message. We simply go to a world mired in sin, and we say God has offered a treaty of peace and a great exchange. Accept it. Now, I don't know most of the people here today, but I have to believe that there's at least one person here today who has never given his life over to Christ. Let me tell you, I, I, I beg you, I beg you, whoever you are, please, Christ has come to reconcile you, to make peace between you and God. Accept the peace. 
Do not live at enmity with God. Do not be His enemy. He's done everything. Come, bow before Him and accept this treaty of peace so that you can have that great exchange where God will now view you as not guilty in His sight because Christ has taken all your guilt on Himself. That's our message. Brothers and sisters, it's not very complicated, but it is absolutely awesome. Awesome. We are ambassadors for Christ. Our lives, our mission, our relationships, everything about us is to reflect a new reality and our purpose Recognizing the fear of the Lord, recognizing the love of Christ, our purpose is to live this life in such a way that the peace of God, the peace of Christ is made available to all human humanity and we become spokesmen offering that peace, offering Christ to a dying world. Be ambassadors for Christ. A spokesman for Him offering His peace to the world. Let's pray.